In this video, we're going to be looking at completeness for the language of predicate logic. In the last video, we introduced the notions of soundness and completeness, and we proved the soundness theorem. Soundness tells us if we've got a proof from premises to a conclusion, then we're never going to have a counterexample to that argument. We're never going to have a model which makes the premises true and the conclusion false. So the soundness theorem tells us that if we've got a proof, then there is no counterexample. Completeness is the converse of that result. If we don't have a counterexample, then we do have a proof. So our entire focus of this video is going to be explaining why this result is true. We're going to go through a proof of the completeness theorem. To do that, what we're actually going to prove is the contrapositive of the result. We're going to show that if there is no proof, then there is a counterexample. If there's no proof that gets us from the collection of statements X to the statement A, then we can find a model which makes all of X true and which makes A false. The way that we're going to prove that is starting with our collection of premises X, and we're going to build this up and make it bigger and bigger and bigger, adding more and more sentences to the collection, so that the set that results at the end of this process will look just like the set of all of the formulas that are true in a particular model. And then we're going to use that set to make a model. So to start us on this journey, we're going to have a look at the formulas that are true in a, in a model to see what the set of all of the formulas true in a model looks like, what kind of properties such a set must have, so that we can get a sense of what's involved in constructing it. So let's suppose we've got a model and we just call T the set of all of the formulas that that model makes true. Then one thing that we can know about T is that a negation is going to be in this set T of sentences true in our model, if and only if the thing that we negated isn't, because a negation is true in a model just when the thing you negate isn't true. So if you pick a formula at random, if it's true, then its negation isn't, and if the negation is true, then it isn't. So of every pair of a formula and its negation, one and only one of those is going to be in the set T. And similarly, if I've got a conjunction in my set T, then both of the conjuncts are also in the set. And if the conjuncts are in the set, then the conjunction is in the set. So a conjunction is going to be in this collection of formulas just when both conjuncts are. No, no more often, no less often than that. And disjunction, similarly, a disjunction is going to be in the set if one or other, or both, of the disjuncts are in the set. And a conditional is going to be in my model, is going to be true in the model, just when either the antecedent isn't or the consequent is. So they're the connectives. And then uh, the contradiction is never true in a model. So this set, this, this set is never going to contain a contradiction formula. Now, for a universally quantified formula, that's going to be in my set. It's going to be true in a model if and only if each instance of it is true in that model, provided that my language contains a name for every object that's in the domain. So if my language is expressive like that, let's assume that it is for the moment, then if the universally quantified formula is in my collection of formulas, then each of its instances is going to be. And conversely, if each of the instances is true in the model, then so is the universally quantified formula. If I didn't have a name for everything in the model, then I would still have that if the universally quantified formula was true, so would, it, it's, would its instances be, but it wouldn't necessarily be uh, the same in reverse, because maybe the counterexamples would be things that I didn't have names for. And now for the existentially quantified formula, it's going to be true. It's going to be in my collection of true formulas, if and only if some instance is in the collection of true formulas. Again, if I've got a name for everything. So each of these conditions are 
conditions on each of the different sorts of logical concepts I've got in my language. Negation, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, uh, the contradiction, and the quantifiers, they each correspond to a different condition on when kinds of formulas are in the set of all of the formulas true in this model. A more general condition which follows from the soundness theorem is that if I could prove a formula from the set of sentences that are true in this model, then that was already in the set. That was already in the set of sentences true in the model. Uh, this follows from soundness because anything that I can prove from a set of uh, premises then there's no counterexample to that argument. So in particular, this model M that I've got is not a counterexample, cannot be a counterexample to the argument from T to A. And so given that T is defined as all of the sentences that are true in the model M, then the formula A has also got to be true in the model M because if it wasn't, then the model would be a counterexample to this argument. But we've already seen that the provable arguments have got no counterexamples. So this gives you an idea of the kinds of properties that a set of sentences that are all the sentences that are true in a model is kind of like. It's like a description of how things might be if the world was like this or if the world was like that. And we've got a language which is rich enough to describe, to name all of the different things that there are according to this way of modeling the world. Now, logicians have given names to some of these sorts of concepts. Uh, one concept that's uh, really important for sets like this is the concept of consistency. That set of sentences that was true in the model uh, is consistent. It doesn't contradict itself. Uh, the general definition of the concept of consistency for a set is this. We'll say that a set of sentences is consistent if you can't prove a contradiction from it. You know, there's no way that there's an contradiction hiding behind these uh, formulas that we've given. You can't prove them inconsistent. And so we'll call the set consistent, if at least it doesn't clash like that. And the set of sentences true in a model is consistent. But lots of different sets are consistent. You know, if I just tell you, here's a sentence, you know, FA, here's another sentence, uh, something has got property G, that's consistent. I'm not going to be able to prove a contradiction from that, but it certainly isn't anything like uh, all of the sentences that are true in some model, because that's a much bigger set than this. Now, consistency is a really useful property because uh, when it comes to trying to prove completeness, because remember, when we're proving completeness, we're going to start with uh, an example where we can't prove A from a bunch of premises X. And then we're going to try and construct a model where all of the X's are true and A isn't. Well, in any case like that, the set X that we started off with is consistent. We can't prove a contradiction from X because we can't prove A from X. Because if we could prove a contradiction from X, then we could prove anything we like from X using the I can infer anything from a contradiction rule. So if I could get a contradiction from X in some big, long, complicated proof, then I could infer A from that just using the rule that I could eliminate a contradiction like this. So uh, that's never going to happen. If I can't prove A from X, then X is always going to be a consistent set in those circumstances. So whenever we're trying to build a model uh, for which makes the X's true and the A false, Whenever we're going to try and do that, we're going to do this with a consistent set X. And we're trying to, you know, make the set a bigger and bigger set so it describes a whole model, so that it gives us a way of constructing a whole description of how things might be, which satisfies all the other conditions. That's going to be the aim for us. Now, one of the things, one of the conditions in that big list that I had a couple of slides ago was, remember, the negation rule, which said that, you know, not A was in my set if and only if A is not in my set. And so one of A and not A is in the set. That should give you an idea that whatever kind of set that we're trying to build, it's going to be really big. You know, for every pair of sentences, something and its negation, one of them has got to be in that set. That means this set is going to be very, very big. In fact, there's a really important sense in which such a set is maximal. 
It's not only consistent, but it's as big as possible among all of the consistent sets. And so we give this a definition. We, we call X a maximal consistent set if it's consistent, all right. But for any of the things which aren't in it, adding it would have made the set inconsistent. So if I had a formula which is not in my set, then just adding that formula to the set would have been bad enough to make it inconsistent. So it's right on the verge of being inconsistent. It's, you know, so opinionated about everything that it's actually got an opinion on everything. It says it gives an answer to every question one way or another. So these are sets which are, are consistent, you know, they can describe how the world is, but they don't leave anything out. They leave no opinion uh, unsought of, as it were. And indeed, if I've got a set of formulas that's true in some models, it's going to be a maximal consistent set. The formula is true in a particular model, decide everything one way or another. And so if there's a formula which is not in that set, it's already excluded because its negation is in there. And so it's got to be a maximal consistent set. And the other property that logicians have given a name to is to be witnessed. And we'll call a, formula, a set of formulas witnessed if whenever it says something has got a property, namely, you know, in this case, there is something which has got the property A, if the formula something is A is in the set, then there is some name which names a thing such that that instance for that name is in the set too. So my set can't just say, you know, there is something which, you know, did the murder, but I don't know who it is. A witness set is only going to say that someone did the murder if it's already got a name for the object that was the murderer. And again, if I've got the set of formulas that's true in some model, then that set uh, is a witness set, provided my, la my language has got a name for everything in the domain of that model. And so the formulas that are true in a model is a maximal consistent witnessed set. So it's consistent and it's maximal among all of the consistent ones and it's witnessed. Now the really neat thing, the first thing that I'll prove, is that a witnessed maximal consistent set has got all of these other nice properties. It's got all of these other nice properties that they contain all of the things that you can prove from them. The negation is in the set just when the thing that you negated isn't. Conjunctions in the set just when the conjuncts are both in, etc., etc. So not only does something with all of these properties have to be a maximal consistent set, but a maximal consistent witness set has got all these properties. Here's why. Firstly, uh, if I could prove A from the set X and X was a maximal consistent set, here's why A is already got to be in the set. If A wasn't in the set, then because A is maximal consistent, X together with A could prove a contradiction, right? That's just what the definition of definition is of being maximal and consistent. But if X and A can prove me a contradiction, and X is enough to prove A, then X can prove the contradiction. Here's why. Because if I've got some proof which gets me from X and A to a contradiction, got that proof. That's, you know, from this assumption that X and A gives me a contradiction. But if X could prove A, then I could, instead of assuming A, I could prove A from X. And now I've got a proof which just makes X as my assumption and proves a contradiction. So I can prove a contradiction just from X by itself. So if X is consistent and it's maximal consistent, then it's already got to contain all of its consequences. So that contradicts the assumption that X is consistent. So if X is maximal consistent, it contains all those consequences, which is really sweet. Now, if not A is in my set, since X is consistent, and since A and not A already prove a contradiction, that's just the negation elimination rule, it follows from that that A can't be in my set X because otherwise X would be inconsistent. So uh, because X is a consistent set, if not A is in the set, then A is not in the set too. That's just consistency, not even maximal consistency is used there. 
On the other hand, if A is not in my set, because A is maximal consistent, that means X and A proves a contradiction. So that means I could prove not A from X using the negation introduction rule, because X and A is enough to give me a contradiction. I could just discharge the A, introduce the negation and say, well, not A follows from X which means that not A has already got to be in the set X because it's a consequence of the set X and we've already proved that X contains all of the things that we can prove from it. Let's do the conditional rules too. If X is maximal consistent, then if A implies B is in the set, then since A implies B and I can prove B, that's just conditional elimination, it's one line proof, then because that's true, if A implies B is in the set, then either A is not in the set, or if A is in the set, B is in the set too, which means either A isn't or B is, which is what we wanted for the conditional uh, condition. That's going from left to right of that if and only if here. So we know that if A implies B is in the set because of this, either A isn't or B is. Now let's do it in reverse. If A is not in the set, then since X and A gives us a contradiction, because it's maximal consistent, then X and A gives us B, because B follows from the contradiction, and then discharging, uh, sorry, that should be arrow introduction, uh, discharging the A here, uh, gives us X gives us A implies B, because you know X and A gives me a contradiction, that was uh, my assumption from A not giving me, and A not being in X because it's maximal consistent. So I can say, well, you know, contradiction gives me B. So discharge the A to get A implies B by the arrow introduction rule. So X gives me A implies B, which means that A implies B is in X. On the other hand, uh, if B is in X, since B gives me A implies B, I can prove A implies B from B, that means that A implies B is in X too. Now, why can I prove B from A implies B? Well, we're allowed to discharge any number of assumptions of A. Zero is a number, so I could discharge zero instances of A to get me A implies B. If you've not seen that before, that might make you feel a little bit weird. Uh, well, don't worry about it. But if you are worrying about it, I can just make a slightly longer proof for you. Let's assume A and assume B and derive A and B with an and introduction. Now we'll immediately get rid of the A uh, to get B uh, with an and elimination. And now I'll discharge this A over here to get A implies B. That's another proof where B is the only undischarged assumption and A implies B is the conclusion. So uh, because B is in my set, I get A implies B in my set too. So going from right to left, we've said that if B is in the set, then A implies B is in the set. And if A isn't in the set, then A implies B is in the set too. So either way, I can get from the right to the left, and we've already proved that I can get from the left to the right. So this condition works too. Let's look at a quantifier example. If X is a witnessed set two, as well as being maximal consistent, then universally quantified formulas in the set, if and only if each instance is in the set. Well, if the universally quantified formula is in the set, since I can prove the instance from it, just using universal quantifier elimination, the instance is in the set two, because again, Maximal consistent sets closed under consequence. On the other hand, if the universally quantified formula ain't in the set, then by maximal uh, consistency, its negation is in the set. You know, uh, it's not too hard to show that. We've already shown the negation uh, instance. So since that's the case, uh, negation negated universally quantified formula in the set and since from the negated universally quantified formula I can prove the existentially quantified negation that's one of the de Morgan shifting laws then we have that this is in the set too because it's one of the consequences of things which is in the set and because this is witnessed 
the some instances in the set, you know, the witnessing condition says for any existentially quantified formula uh, in a set, some instance has got to be in the set. So not a n is in my set for some name n, which means that for some name n, a n's got to not be in the set because, you know, the set's consistent. Uh, so a n can't be in the set as well as not a n because then I could prove a contradiction if they were. And so we've shown that if the universally quantified formula isn't in the set, some instance isn't in the set. Contraposing that means that if every instance is in, then the universally quantified formula is in too. Now, the other cases that we've left out are for contradiction, conjunction, disjunction, and existential quantifier. And we're going to do them in class because they're the other instances, but they work in exactly the same way. So working through the details for you will give you a sense of how uh, these facts about maximal consistent sets, uh, which are witnessed, uh, work. So I'm going to declare this theorem, this part of the, th the proof done. So to finish our completeness proof, we need to actually construct a witnessed maximal consistent set. We're going to suppose that I can't prove A from X, and we're going to make a witnessed maximal consistent set, which contains all the elements of X, but more, and which still doesn't allow us to prove A. And then we're going to use that as the raw materials for making a model, which makes all of these things true, uh, but still doesn't make A true. And so that's going to be a counterexample to our argument from X to A. So if we don't have a proof, we're going to end up with a counterexample. Now, the first thing to notice when we do this is that we might need to have more names in our language than we originally started off with. For example, you might already have a language where N1, N2, N3, N4, imagine they're all the names, N1, N2, N3, N4, etc., etc., just with all the numbers, that they're all the names that we've got. Now, this argument that I've sketched here which gets us from the premises n1 is f, n2 is f, n3 is f, and I've got all the premises I like, f, n1, n2, n3, n4. In fact, I allow us to have as a premise f, n, where n is any of the names in my language, that those premises are not enough to prove the conclusion that everything is f. You know, I can never prove that everything is F from those premises because I could always construct a model where these things happen to all have the property F. Imagine I've got my domain and I've got my objects and those things have all got the property F. And then there's some other things which didn't get named by these names which don't have the property F. So... But these things could be all of the names in the language that I use to set up the argument. I'm going to want to be able to construct a counterexample where the language contains all of these names, but I need some names to name these things too. So I need to have more names at my disposal than I started off with. So to do this, I'm going to allow us to extend our language with a supply of extra names, which I'm just going to call C1, C2, C3, C4. It's got to be an unending supply because it might be that I always need to be able to construct a new thing, which might be a new counterexample to a new thing that I haven't got to yet, where these things were names that weren't used in my original set of premises. I just need to have extra new names to deal with possible instances of uh, quantifiers or witnesses to existentially quantified formula. Then what I'm going to do is in the language that results, using all the predicates names and everything from the original set of premises, X, whatever that was, and my new name, C1, C2, C3, and C4, I'm going to have the whole language. I'm going to think of absolutely every formula that I can construct out of those uh, bits of language, and I'm going to order them all in a list. 
uh, I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, I6. I'm just going to think of those language, those sentences in the language as produced by some routine, some algorithm or routine, which produces sentences one after the other in a big list. Later in the course, uh, if you're have questions about how you could enumerate all of these things in the next few weeks after this we'll, we'll talk about that but for the moment just take that as given the neat thing about any such list like this is that as these formulas are on my list which goes on and on and on and on and on each formula is finitely long each formula has got a finite number of symbols in it uh, no formula is infinitely long. And so each formula only uses some finite number of these fresh names uh, that I've got, these extra names. And so that means that wherever I am in this list of formulas, I will never have used all of these names up. This list has got this property that for any number n in this process of constructing formulas in my language, there's going to be a name uh, cm somewhere in this a collection of new names, which is not in my original set. In fact, these names were never in my original set, but is also not in the first n uh, formulas that I've considered so far in my list. We call that name fresh. It's uh, a new name. It's a name which has never been used before as I'm considering these formulas one by one. And I'm going to be considering these formulas one by one because the kind of set that I'm constructing, remember it's a maximal consistent set, which is witness two, it's got to be, uh, you know, that opinionated sort of set that a model uh, describes. It's going to say yes or no to any different formula. So what I'm going to do as these formulas are presented to me one by one, I'm going to make a decision about it and say, is it going to be true in my model or not? Yes or no. Is it going to be true in my model or not? Yes or no. Is it going to be worthy to be added to my list of formulas? And I'm going to say yes or no to each of these formulas one by one. And so this new collection of names is going to be such that whenever I need to name a new thing that I haven't named yet, there's going to be a name in my language that I could pick for that. This collection of names is never exhausted. So this is the recipe for making that set X star of all of the formulas that are going to be in this model that I'm trying to construct. We're going to start off with my set X and I'm going to throw in not A. Uh, because I already know that my model wants to make A false. Remember, I started out with the argument from X to A. So we're going to say, we're going to take all of the X, all of the formulas in X to be true. We're going to take A to be false. And we're going to call X zero. That's the, uh, the, the, the ground level stage before doing any steps of construction. That is going to be my, my uh, starting set. And we know that that's consistent already because X can't prove A. So that's set x0. Now, we're going to consider each formula on our list, a n, where n is 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, any number I like. And every, every formula is going to be considered one by one. For each formula on the list, a n, we do this. We add it to the set that we've constructed so far in the previous step, call that x n minus 1. And if the result can't prove a contradiction yet, then we add this formula an to my set. On the other hand, if when I add the set, the formula an to my set, I get a contradiction, then I don't add it. So if I, for my first formula a1, I start with a x0 and I check a1. Does it allow me to prove a contradiction? Well, if I can prove a contradiction, I stay with x0. On the other hand, if I can't prove a contradiction from a1 and x0, then x1 is x0 together with a1. And then I do this at the next stage, considering a2 and a3 and a4. And at each stage, the sets get uh, each formula gets considered. And so x5 is the result of considering the formulas a1, a2, a3, a4, and a5, and throwing them in if I can, and leaving them out if I can't throw them in. Uh, when can't I throw them in? It's if throwing them in makes the set inconsistent. 
And so this has got the property that if a set at one stage is consistent, so is the next, because we never add a formula to get an inconsistent set. We only add a formula if the result is still consistent. And because the start was consistent, we're going to be consistent the whole way along. Now, that first bit is most of the process, except I lied just in one case. There's one exception that I need to deal with. If the formula that I'm choosing is an existentially quantified formula, so it starts with a, an existential quantifier, then if I was going to throw it in as well, if I was going to throw that formula in, so if it was consistent to add, then not only do we add the formula, but we add an instance too where the name that we use is fresh. It's a name which doesn't occur so far in the set that I've constructed, and it isn't elsewhere in this formula here. So I choose a new instance. Now, this we can do without being inconsistent because since the name is fresh, if I could prove a contradiction from uh, this pair of formulas together with x n minus 1, then the existential elimination rule would allow me to prove a contradiction from this formula by itself because we could just discharge this guy and replace it with this guy just in an existential elimination uh, step. But that's we can't prove a contradiction from this instance because that was the assumption that we started off with. So the rule for the existential quantifier tells us this is safe. We can add a name uh, for a witness like this, uh, and that's no extra cost to the inconsistency of the set because uh, the name is fresh. And that freshness condition is exactly uh, what we need to preserve consistency. So it's got to be not necessarily anything else that we've referred to, but if there is something with this property, then we could name such a thing. And then the result of the process is just the result of doing this again and again and again and again, stage after stage after stage. So a formula is going to be in my endpoint for this infinite process if and only if it was added at some stage along the way. So if I want to figure out whether my formula gets in, I just look and see where on the list it's going to be considered and just do the process up to then and say, uh, did you get chucked in? And if it did, uh, then it's in my set x star. And if it isn't, then it isn't. Now, this uh, process is highly specific to the order that I consider the formulas in. You know, that could be my, my original set X here might say nothing about whether P is true or P isn't true for some given formula P. And both of them, it would be easy with. And then it's just a question, which of P and uh, not P uh, is considered first? Or are there other things which are considered first which imply P or not P in combination with the other things that I've considered? And so uh, the kind of formula, the kind of set of formulas that I get out of this really depends on the order in which I consider things. Uh, but that's cool because they're often, for an argument that is invalid, are going to be many different models uh, which uh, would be counterexamples to the argument. This is just a process which is going to construct a model, and different ways of ordering the formulas will give you different models. Now, the result of this process is a set of formulas, uh, which are all of the things that we've thrown in. This set is indeed consistent because each of the things that we added along the way was only added to preserve consistency. So each of the stages that I prove, uh, that, I, that I construct along the proof, are going to be consistent. And there's no way I could prove a contradiction from the whole set of formulas, because there's no such thing in our system as an infinite proof. And the definition of consistency is I could prove a contradiction. So any proof that I have is just a finite tree. So any proof of a contradiction from x star is just going to be some proof where I could prove a contradiction. And that's just going to, you know, 
appeal to a bunch of formulas, and it's only going to prove uh, it's only going to appeal to finitely many of them. So I just list out all of the formulas that are at the assumptions of this proof, and they're all going to have been considered sometime and thrown in. So they're going to be. I could just do the process up until the last one of those was considered. And then that's going to be some xn along the way. And that is consistent because each of the stages along the way are consistent. So that means the whole thing's got to be consistent too. But it's also maximal consistent because for anything which is not in the set, the only reason we didn't throw it in was because adding it would have been inconsistent. So the only way you can be left out is if uh, you'd already been excluded uh, by something that had been added earlier. And so that means that if something isn't in the set, then adding it to some, you know, adding it to the set that we've constructed by the time it came up for consideration was already enough to be inconsistent. So clearly adding it to the whole thing is going to be inconsistent too, because that contains everything that you've done so far. But it's also a witness set because every existentially quantified formula in the language uh, was considered along the way. And whenever it was considered, if it was thrown in, uh, then a witness for it was thrown in too. So any existentially quantified formula which is in it has explicitly got a witness. So it's a witness set. So we've constructed our set X star, and it is a maximal consistent set, and it's witnessed. Last stage is to construct a model out of it. Well, since X star is witnessed and a maximal consistent set, we're going to construct this model MX star like this. The domain is just going to be all of the names that we used in the set. And the interpretation of a predicate is going to say true to a bunch of names, a tuple of names, just when the sentence that says F is true of those names is in the set X star, and it's going to assign zero otherwise. So it's going to say true to those, uh, to those objects where the sentence f of those objects is actually in my set, and it's going to say false otherwise. So you're just going to do exactly what the set says. And then we're going to prove by induction that a formula is true in my model if and only if the formula is in that set. Now, you've already seen what an induction proof is like. We're going to show that it works for the smallest formulas, the atomic formulas. And then we're going to assume that it holds for a bunch of formulas and prove that it uh, also holds for formulas that you can construct out of them in one step. And since then any formula is just constructed from atomic formulas in a finite number of steps, this property of if it's in the set, it's true in the model is going to be preserved all along the way. So here's the base case of the argument. The atomic formula F of A1 up to AN is true in my model. If and only if F is in the set of formulas, well, that is just the definition of how the model works. So that was uh, given to us. The inductive steps uh, are given to us by the things that we proved, the conditions that we proved held of witnessed maximal consistent sets. So we've already verified that X star, because it's a maximal consistent set, satisfies each of these conditions. Negation is in X star just when the thing negated isn't. Conjunctions in X star if and only if both conjuncts are, etc. That was the nice properties of being a witness maximal consistent set. So we can prove that a negation is true in my model. If and only if the thing negated is not true in my model. That's just the definition of a model. Now, if we assume that the condition for A already holds, so A is not true in a model, if and only if A is not true in the set, then we can use this fact to say that A isn't true in, isn't in the set if and only if its negation is. So this fact together with the connection between mx star and x star for a means that we've also got the connection between mx star 
and X star for naught I. So this condition here tells us that uh, being true in the model, if and only if you're in the set, lifts from formulas to their negations. And, you know, for example, the universally quantified condition tells us that the same thing lifts for universally quantified formulas. A universally quantified formula is true in my model if and only if each instance is true in the model. That's the truth condition for the universally quanti quantified formula in a model. Now, that instance is true in the model if and only if the formula is in the set. That's the assumption for induction because the instance is a simpler formula than the quantified formula. And because the instance is in the set, if and only if the universally quantified formula is in the set, we've already proved that bit, we can piece all of those together and say that the universally quantified formula is true in the model, if and only if that formula is true, is in the set. And each of the other cases works in exactly the same way as well. And so the theorem is done. These properties tell us that the model that we construct out of a witnessed maximal consistent set of formulas is indeed a model of all of the formulas in that set. So we've gone all the way back to where we started. We proved soundness in the previous video, and now we've proved completeness. We've proved completeness because we have shown that if I can't prove A from the set X, then I can construct out of X uh, and not A, a witnessed maximal consistent set X star, which then is going to be giving us everything that we need. It's going to give us the domain, gives us the interpretation of the predicates to construct a model MX star, which makes all of the things that are in X true and I false. And so that is a counterexample to the argument from X to I. So that tells us that if I can't prove A from X, there's got to be a counterexample argument out there somewhere that could be found. And so contraposing that, that tells us that if there's no counterexample, there must be a proof. Because if there wasn't a proof, we could construct a counterexample. Putting those two things together, for any argument at all, either there is a proof or there is a counterexample. That's completeness, that's what we've just proved. Soundness tells us that we can't have both. We can't both have a proof and a counterexample. So what we've done is the first great uh, sort of meta-theoretic result about logic that was proved in the 20th century, connecting uh, provability and counterexamples, soundness and completeness. This concludes the first section of the, the course. In the next section, we're going to look at a bunch of things that follow from this about the power and limits of predicate logic.